Hi everyone, my name is Isil Hashimi and I will be your moderator for this session. And welcome all to the third webinar of Reservoir Characterization Classics and Carbonate. I would like to introduce our presenter uh, again, Dr. Mustafa Orabi. Dr. Mustafa Orabi has a 25 years experience in petroleum industry. He holds a PhD degree from North Carolina State University, the United States and a master and bachelor degree from Alexandria University. Dr. Arabi also joined Alexandria University in his early career as an assistant lecturer till he obtained his master degree. Dr. Arabi also used to teach at community colleges in the United States. In the industry, Dr. Arabi holds many positions in all aspects of petroleum industry and lived in many countries around the globe. Dr. Arabi, you can start the session. Thank you very much, Uh Welcome, everybody, again. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know it's uh, time difference in different countries. Uh, again, this is the third webinar, as Russell said, uh, regarding reservoir characterization, plastics, and carbonates. Uh, let me remind you with the uh, sequence of lectures that we agreed on. Uh, lecture three, which is today's lecture, is a core to log calibration of reservoirs. This will be talking about statistical multi-well permeability for zonation and flow units. So we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, statistical evaluation of multi-wells. We'll start with a single well, then we move to multi-wells. And then we'll see why we're really talking about zonations and flow units and what are these, uh, why this is important as a bar characterization. And again, uh, my understanding that you guys had a webinar or a full uh, course on statistical evaluation. So I will just touch base on the basics of these things, just uh, to refresh your memory on what are the statistical evaluation, what kind of the statistical evaluation. There is one statistics that we usually use in multi-well processing and multi-well evaluation. I will touch base on it. I may not go into depth uh, on this, but if you really need a in-depth evaluation when we reach this, I will mention that as well. If you, if you really need in-depth evaluation, if you guys didn't hear about it uh, in, the, in the previous uh, webinar and previous course, uh, I will actually be happy to uh, touch base on this in the last lecture, the review and Q&A. Probably I will, I will touch base on this if you guys still require some more information on the statistical evaluation. Okay. Uh, so the today uh, presentation will be the field statistics and flow units evaluation on multi-well uh, evaluation. Okay. Before I start, actually, there was an, a note I need to say about the quiz one. Uh, multiple of you guys found there was really a mistake in the answers of the uh, last question on quiz one. Uh, that's true. I, a look at it and I apologize for this actually uh, yes it was wrong and the right answers to this is actually the, um, the inclination angle is 79 and the azimuth angle is 60 degrees so if you, if you came up with these two numbers yes that's true that's that's, that's it's uh, rounding the numbers to 79 and 60 so that's that's be the right one I'm pretty sure the Dr. Ahmed and, uh, and the people working with him they would take into consideration that there was really a mistake in the, uh, in the answers that was posted as the answer for the, uh, for the quiz one. Okay, they'll be taken care of, don't worry about it. It's not gonna affect your grades. Okay. Now we need to talk about the single well lithology from neutron and then remember this is just a quick review in what we uh, covered previously because we will build on it. So I'm gonna make a very, very quick review on how we identified lithology from the neutron density overlay. Uh, we talked about the API asking us to put the neutron and the density on the same scale. Uh, I'm sorry, on the same track. And we are forced to use certain type of scales. The has to be a limestone scale. Uh, the neutron scale will be from 45 to negative 15. Density is 1.95 to 2.95. And we found there are actually values of using this. That's not really a mistake or anything. It's just something that we standardize or the, or the API standardizes. Uh, just for the sake of getting everybody uh, looking at the same thing, evaluating the same thing. What we actually ended up with is looking at the behavior of the neutron density, we can find out the lithology. We combine the neutron density overlay with the gamma ray. Once we look at the gamma ray and we see it's high, our expectation to see the neutron density are separating. 
where the neutron goes to left and the density goes to right. When I say goes to left and goes to right, that's just a very quick thing by eyes, but it does mean that the, the, the porosity will, in, will be high in the neutron and the density will be high on the density. So being left for the neutron, being uh, right for the, uh, for the density, that's the separation we're expecting to see when the gamma ray is high, and that actually identifies lithology as clay. Yeah. Uh, everybody knows that I actually don't use the word shale, I'm not very, uh, you know, very supportive of saying what shale. I prefer to go call it clay to put things in perspective, because when you graduate or when you work in the industry, uh, the word shale now means something different than just clay. Uh, shale is not a bad word anymore. Actually, we produce from shale, so let's just call things by the name. This is clay. This is clay mineral. Let's just call it clay mineral. Okay. Then we looked at uh, the, the, the change of the separation. When we found that the density now is going left and the nutrients are going right, we actually said that this should be sand. Okay? So the sandy stone, it takes the stub of separation. Limestone, because it's, it's a limestone scale, so there is no need for any separation. So limestone will be overlaying, neutron and density will overlay. That's in limestone formation. So limestone formation, because limestone scale and limestone formation, there is no need for any type of separation. The separation happens because you're having wrong lithology on the wrong scale. That's what we say. Wrong lithology means you have sandy stone on limestone scale. Then you are not expecting to overlay. You have to separate. Similarly, we have the dolomite. We can see the dolomite goes exactly like the clay. So the clay separation, which is neutron to the left, density to the right, actually happens again in the dolomite. Then somebody can say, how can I differentiate? It's very simple. If your dolomite is a reservoir, then the gamma ray is clean. So when you see a clean gamma ray and separation neutron left and density right, that's, just, that's exactly what the dolomite is supposed to look like. Actually, I received a question from one of you guys talking about sometimes the separation goes back and forth. And, you know, this is true. Actually, if you, if you actually work in a complex reservoir, uh, sometimes this, that separation would be something that depends on your skills and your experiences. <laughs> Everything has, has its own uh, differences when you have when you get to complex lithology. Okay? So these things are the basics of the separation between neutron density. You see it in many, many wells, but in many cases also, in some cases that if you have, for example, siltstone, which has a higher uh, grain density than the normal lime, uh, sandy stone, which is 2.65, Sometimes you see the siltstone 2.68, 2.69. That will affect the separation a little bit. So that, that goes for complex lithology. But for the time being, I'd just like for you guys to stick with these definitions. And when you get your experiences more and more, you see more wells, your, your skills will be built up and you will see things in a much clearer way. But these are the basics that the API and everybody is looking at and evaluating accordingly. Okay? Then we start to talk about the porosity. Which porosity is the right porosity? Okay? We, we agreed on that the, that the neutron porosity is not the right porosity. Density porosity is not the right porosity. The right porosity is the average neutron density porosity. When we took the average neutron density porosity for sandy stone, limestone, and dolomite, we came up with the 20 PU. That's exactly the 20 PU that we expected in our, in our reservoirs. So when you have neutron and density, never ever use the neutron porosity or the density porosity. Okay? Both are wrong. The actual reservoir porosity is the average between the neutron and the density porosity. Okay? We call this sometimes in the industry cross-plot porosity. So if you hear the word cross-plot porosity, it's exactly what we mean when we say it in academia like you know, neutron density average porosity. Okay? So that's the, the way we look at lithology, the way we look at porosity, and we explained this previously in the previous webinar. Okay? Now, for the water saturation also, we talked about water saturation, it depends. We look at our uh, uh, water saturation in our pores, we have two different types of pores. Either the pore will be clean pore, which means there is no clay or there is not much clay. Yeah, it can be 5%, 10% is fine, but if it's more than 10%, like 30, 40%, then we have to look at which model we need to use for calculation of water saturation. If, the, if the, uh, the pores are clean as the, as the upper picture, okay, then RSHI will be the one to use. So the decision that you will make, which saturation model I should use, 
that will depend on your evaluation. When you look at your evaluation and your clay volume is less than 10%, that's okay. Go ahead and use RC. RC is a very simple uh, equation. Go ahead and use RC. So RC will be suitable in this case. And there should be no clay effects. That's the RC. RC works only for clean formation. When you see a formation that has higher clay volume, then RC will not going to help you out. You need to go for something that will take into consideration the clay volume and the clay uh, effect in the conductivity because clays are conductive. So that will reduce your rock resistivity. So you have to take into account the effect of clay as a volume and as conductivity. And the one of the models, there are so many models, one of the models that's straightforward is the Siemens model. Siemens model takes into consideration the clay volume and also takes in, into consideration the clay resistivity. So he took the clay volume and the clay resistivity, started to correct for RC. RC doesn't have anything called V clay or anything called R clay. So it, it, the RC does not work if you have V clay greater than 10%, for example. And we actually did this, this exercise before in the previous webinars. When you take VC, when you put VC equals zero, mean the clay volume equals to zero, that very uh, complicated equation, equation will reduce to RC equation. Because if VC equals zero, RC will be applied. So this equation will reduce back to RC. Okay, so when you, when you have uh, shaley sand, uh, go ahead and use Simando. When you have clean formation, go ahead and use RC. So that's what we agreed on in the previous, uh, in the previous webinar. Today, we need to talk about something very important called effective porosity. <laughs> what is effective porosity? Actually, effective porosity is the porosity that you will produce from. Then somebody will say, isn't it the same porosity that we just calculated, the average neutron density porosity? So that one, the answer is no. The reason is, effective porosity, it depends also on whom you are talking to. The petrophysist, the formation evaluation guys, the characterization guys define the effective porosity different than the reservoir engineering guys. So guys, I need you to get this thing in your, in your mind clearly. When you talk to a reservoir engineer, he defines effective porosity, porosity different than the way that the petrophysist, the, reservoir, the, uh, the uh, formation evaluation, and the reservoir characterization guys are defined. For the, for the people, petrophysics, formation evaluation, characterization, effective porosity means clay corrected porosity. Since clay actually lives inside your pores, this means it takes part of your pore volume. This means that this part of the pore volume occupied by clay will not be a place where the hydrocarbon can live in. So in this case, if you take the total porosity, which is what the tool actually reads. Tool reads everything, regardless it's clay or non-clay. Tool doesn't differentiate between this or that. So the tool will not be able to differentiate between the part that's not affected by clay and the part that's affected by clay. So it's your job as a reservoir characterization engineer and as a formation evaluation engineer and as a petrophysicist, whatever you call it, and whatever the discipline that you are working in, you have to calculate what's called clay corrected porosity. So that's the definition of effective porosity for these type of people, petrophysicists, formation evaluation, and reservoir characterization. When you talk to a reservoir engineer, the reservoir engineer is actually concerned about the flow of the fluids. He's concerned about production. So in this case, Effective porosity to him is connected porosity, the porosity that are connected together. Because if there is no connectivity between pores, there is no flow. Okay, so the reservoir engineer who talks about the flow of the fluids inside the the, the, the formation is the one who's, who's defining effective porosity different. So for reservoir engineers, it is the connected porosity. So if there is no permeability, for example and the porosity are not connected, that means to him that the effective porosity is zero, even, even if you have pores in the formation. The pores need to be connected for his flow, for the, when he goes and look at the reservoir modeling, it's actually a dynamic modeling. 
Dynamic modeling means the, the, the hydrocarbon and the water needs to flow. If there is no permeability, there is no flowability. So the reservoir engineer definition in the, for the effective porosity is the connected porosity. So be careful whom you are talking to, because many people actually see different definitions in effective process. But if you put this in your mind, the one, it depends on which one, who, who are you talking to? If, if he's the one really uh, concerned very much on productivity and, and fluid movement, then he needs to wait for the pores to be connected. So connectivity of the pores is more important to him than being uh, clean or not. So for the petrophysics formation evaluation and reservoir characterization, it's a clay corrected pores. To the, to the reservoir engineer add to this, that has to be connected for as well, okay? All right, so connectivity is controlled by permeability. If there is no permeability, there is no conductivity, and we will touch base on this, uh, in, this in this webinar in some more details later, okay? Now, we just step, uh, try to calculate a single well-affected frost. How can we calculate a single well-affected frost, okay? What is effective frost? We say that clay lives in the pore space. That's a fact. Clays, they live in the pore space. So we need to correct for that volume of the pore space occupied by the clays. Okay? So in this case, we say this reduces my rock porosity. Okay? So the pore volume will be reduced by the effect of clay living in my pore space. Right? For example, if we look at this example right here, we can see actually definitions and we can build a full, full of the analysis. I can see the upper section looks like I had lots of clays in there. The, the clay is the one that is greenish. So this is the clay and this is the sandy stone. So it, this, that clay part is the uh, volume of the clay on foot by foot basis. Okay, on foot by foot basis. I can see a zone on the top that's actually full of clay and then things get cleaner and then the, the clay comes back again, and then it comes clean again. This is the way that the clay is distributed in this reservoir. So my goal now is to correct this porosity for the effect of the clay. So the, the effect of porosity in this case is correcting the porosity for the effect of the clay, okay? So here is a zone that's actually clean zone, followed by a zone that you can see some of the clay volumes in there, and then comes back again as clean. You can see the variation of the clay volume across my reservoir in a sandstone reservoir. Now, how can I calculate the effective porosity in this one? The one that we just calculated before, which is the neutron density, average porosity is not the, cor the clay correct, it's the total porosity, okay? So when we define this, it requires correction. And the correction goes, the fee effective is actually the total minus the clay effect. So you need to correct the total porosity that the tool reads, subtract from it, or, or subtract the clay effect from this total porosity, you get the effective porosity, okay? When I say fee total, I can actually change this, and I can say it's actually fee tool, because the, total re the tool reads the total. So it's actually fee effective is the fee tool minus, minus the clay effect. Now, one by one, how can I calculate the clay effect? How can I get the clay effect? So what is the clay effect? It's simply the volume of clay multiplied by the reading of the 100% clay. For example, if I told you 100% clay will read 20 PU. Now, we have only 10% clay. So what is the velocity that this 10% clay appears on my log? The 100% clay reads 20. Now we have only 10%. Then if you multiply 10% by that 20, that gives you the contribution of the clay in the pores. So that's why you need to find out what is the clay volume. You multiply this by the 100% clay porosity. So you go to a zone that has 100% clay, and then you read the neutron density porosity in this zone. That's the total, that's the 100% clay porosity. Now multiply this by the volume of your clay that gives you the contribution of that small volume of clay on your pores, okay? So the clay effect is my clay volume 
multiplied by the 100% or, or the reading of the porosity of 100% clay. We'll take an example here to apply, apply for this. Okay? So the clay effect is the V clay times the, the, the response of the 100% clay on the neutron density process. Now, if I take this and I plug it in this equation, then my phi effective is simply phi total minus V clay times the response of the 100% clay. So if I need it to do this, then I can calculate the phi effect. Okay? So let's just take an example here. Calculate effective porosity at the marked depth. So actually here, my log again, and here is the marked depth. I marked that depth in this red dot, okay? I need to calculate the effective porosity here. Why? Because as you see at that depth, there are some clay volume here. This means the porosity I'm reading here is total porosity, is not effective. I need to correct for the effect of this volume of clay on my porosity. Why? Because this volume of clay lives inside my pores. I need to correct for it. So once we do that, we need to do this, then our fee effective as we agreed is the total reading or the tool reading minus V clay times V clay, okay? okay? One by one. I need to find out where, where how can I get the 100% clay porosity? It's very simple. You go to the plot that we just showed here. You go to the zone that you interpret as 100% clay. So we need first to figure this out. Where is the zone that has 100% clay? Now, it is actually this point. This point, is at 100% clay, because this is my clay volume. So this one represents 100% clay. So I need to find out the porosity F of this 100% clay. What I need to do, I need to take a line here. You go to right in the middle, remember, the, the porosity from the neutron density. Not the neutron, not the density, it's the average. So you get right in the middle, and you read the value of the, your porosity in the middle. So this is actually about 35, or I'm sorry, about 15 PU. So the fee for the porosity of 100% clay is 15 P. So I figured this out. So the way to figure the 100% clay volume is to look at your interpretation. Where is the 100% clay point? This is the 100% clay point. What is the reading of the neutron density of this 100% clay point? Here is the reading of the neutron density right in the middle between the neutron and the density. So I find this out, okay? Now, the second one, I need to find my V clay. Where is my point that I need to calculate my, my effective porosity at? Here is the point. Now I go to this point and I read the volume of the clay and I did the, my analysis already. Then I go up to the volume of clay and I read the volume of the clay. If you read the volume of the clay here, my clay volume in the, at this depth is 40%, which is 0.4. So the clay volume at this depth is 40%, okay? So now I figured out what is the, the clay, uh, the 100% clay if, if, uh, response of porosity from the neutron density. I found out my V clay by looking at my evaluation. My V clay at this point is 40%, which is 0.4. Now, what is the tool reading at this point? I go at, to this point and I take a line here between the neutron density Go there, and I read the value of my porosity at this point. So the tool, the tool is reading, is reading about 35 pu. So the total, the tool is reading about 35 pu in this case. So the neutron is reading 50, uh, for, the clay is reading 40 percent. The tool is reading 35 pu. Now, if I go and apply this, and I say my tool to total is 35 minus my V clay is 0.4 times the fee clay is 35, you just do the math, then your fee effective in this zone is 21 PU. Then I corrected my porosity for the clay effect. You need to do this for the entire law. We did this exercise for one, well, for one point, but you need to do that for the entire law. For sure, you do it for the entire law, you will use a software that can calculate this for you, but at least, you know what is the effective porosity and how can you use it, use the software to calculate your effective porosity. So to calculate the effective porosity, you need the tool porosity, you need the clay volume, and you need the 100% clay response.
Once you know this, then you can correct every single depth for the effect of clay at this depth, and you come up with what we call effective process. Okay? So, once we calculated the effective porosity, now we need to look at statistically how my effective porosity is distributed in my reservoir. Okay? My reservoir is a shaly sandy stone. I have actually my reservoir, some clean zones, some zone that has some clay effect, and also some other clean zones at the bottom, which is the example that we, we just discussed. So I need to figure this out. I calculated the effective porosity for the entire section of my reservoir. Now, I need to look at statistically, what is my porosity in my reservoir? When you say statistically, the one that we like to know for the most is what is the average porosity that we have in my reservoir? What is the average porosity I have in my reservoir? For sure, since you drill your wells in different locations in the field, every well will have its own average. It's not going to be the same average. Okay? It depends on where you drill. Some of the part of the field will have higher porosity. Some parts will have lower porosity. Some parts will have an intermediate porosity. So you need to do this for every single well of your reservoir. Let's just do it for at least for the well that we just mentioned today. And it's just to calculate the statistically what is the average porosity that you have, okay? We use histogramming to do this. So the histogram will actually give me what is the average porosity in my section, which I call reservoir, and I calculated my porosity in. So the histogram is the one that we use to calculate our average porosity. Histograms are defined with average, defined with the standard deviation, and again, I'm not going to talk about this because I, I, I know that you guys had a full uh, course on statistical evaluation. Dr. Yasser Shaib, I think he is the one who did this. So my, I, I will assume that you guys know this uh, very well. But at least I will go uh, through the, uh, the evaluation here. Now, here is my entire porosity I calculated. Here, that, 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 uh, yeah, that white part here is my entire porosity. I need to look at statistically statistically, how my porosity is distributed in this reservoir. The one that's going to do this for me is the histogram. So this is the histogramming where you can see the distribution of porosity. You can see some, some very low uh, occurrence, occurrence here at low porosity, some low occurrence at the high porosity, and you can see most of them are in a certain uh, value of porosity, which we call the mean porosity. When you do any histogramming, the histogram itself, in any software you use for evaluation of multi-wells, it will actually give you statistical numbers. Here is the statistical numbers for this well. It will give me, here is my top and bottom of my zone. For example, my zone starts at 12,250, it ends at 12,320. So this is the thickness of my reservoir. It will give me the minimum value of my porosity. It gives me the maximum value of my porosity. So the minimum value of my porosity is almost zero. So I have zones actually that doesn't have any porosity whatsoever. And it gives you also, also something called mean, which is the average porosity. So the average porosity in my reservoir here is 14% or 14.2%. So that zone that I'm working on now as an average porosity for this is actually 14%. Okay? So I got that by looking at statistical distribution of my effective porosity. You do that for the effective because the total porosity doesn't mean anything to you. Total porosity has some clay effect. And we just ex explained previously how we can get the effective porosity, the one that my hydrocarbon will live in, which is the most important part to me. I don't really care about how much of the, of the clays live in my pores. That's actually bad news. But I need to look at the part of my pores that's clean and my, and my hydrocarbon, when it migrates, it will live inside my pores. So the mean value of my section in this well is about 14.2% of porosity. So I knew from the histogram the average porosity of this well using the, the mean or the mode or the, the, of, the, uh, of this well. Okay? Now, how to create the effective porosity histogram? Let's just at least I will quickly go over this because you guys i need to know you to know this very well 
well, this is very, very important. And I need it also for some other slides coming up. So I will go through this, how we can generate the porosity histogram, just for you guys to understand what does it mean, okay? So effective porosity histogram, let's assume that I have this table. Here is my, my depth and here is my effective porosity. So I picked a few depths from my, from my pore, from 100, 890 down to about 2,000. And here are the, uh, are the porosity at each one of these depths. How can I calculate or how can I draw a histogram of these data? There are steps, guys, to do this, okay? These steps you need to train yourself on because you can do that actually on Excel. Even You don't really need to have a very sophisticated software. So what are the steps? What, what is the histogramming? The histogramming is actually a mean of looking at the frequency, the frequency of certain data appearing in my data, in my data structure. What do I mean by this? First of all, the first step is to look at the data that you have and you need to determine the minimum value and the maximum value of this data. So this is the first thing you need to do. If I look at my porosity here and I look, say, what, where is my minimum porosity? You have to take a look at the, all the porosity or you go in Excel and you use the minimum value or the minimum function in Excel. It will tell you the minimum value of this data is this. So here, for example, the minimum value here is this value and the maximum value here is this value. So I did, by looking at the data I have, I determine the minimum value and the maximum value, okay? We actually call this the range. So the range of the data, the range of my data, starts from a certain minimum value to a certain maximum value. So my range of data, my range of porosity in my data set is between porosity minimum and porosity maximum. So this is the first thing to do to actually generate a histogram, okay? What's the next step? The next step is to take that range and you divide it into some intervals. For example, I'll go here and I say, here is my range, because you see that line right there. Here is my range, and I will divide my range into small segments, small intervals. For example, I will go from zero to 16, but I will take from zero, four, from four to eight, from eight to 12, from 12 to 16. So I take my range and then I divide my range into segments. How many segments? It's up to you. Some will divide into five segments, some will divide into 10 segments. It's up to you, okay? But it's actually, the, the, it depends on how, how you are trained on how to, to get the divisions of your, your histogram, okay? So the idea is to, first of all, to find out what is the range that you have, then you take the range and you divide it into interval. Then what? Then count the number of the points in each interval. For example, let's just take one interval as example. First interval is from zero to four. I need to go to look at the data that I have, and I need to find out how many data points that actually between zero and four, greater equal zero, less equal four. Look at all the data. How many, num how many of my data points, what is the number of my data points that actually within this interval. Let's just do this exercise from zero to four. Here is the first point. Here is the second point. This, this, all these points are from zero to four. Here is the third point, 2.9 still from zero to four. Here is the, the fourth point, 1.9 still from zero to four. If I continue looking at all the data, no more. So I have four points that actually within this interval. So you decide this, and you, this is the number, so the number of data points in my data set that has porosity greater or equal zero, less equal four, this number, these are four data points in my data set. We call this frequency. Frequency means how many times it happened. It happened four times. I found four data points in this range. So these four times, we call it frequency. So we have two things now. We have range and we have frequency. The range is the total range of my data from minimum to maximum. I divided this range into intervals. Then I count the number of data points happening in each interval, the frequency of, of, of occurrence in a certain interval, because this is the frequency. 
Okay? Then you plot frequency versus range. You plot frequency versus range. Okay? When you do this, here is the frequency versus friction. Frequency is the y-axis. Range is the x-axis. And I found from 0 to 4, I found four frequencies. What is the four frequencies? I found four data points happening in this range. I'm sorry, in this interval. Happening in this interval. So that's the, the first thing. Second, you do the same thing for the second interval. What is the second interval from 4 to 8? Okay, from 4 to 8. Greater than 4, less than 8. Okay, where is it? Okay, here is the first one. 5.7 is greater than 4, less than 8. What's the second one? Is 7.7 .7 greater than 4, less than 8. What's the third one? 7.6 greater than 4, less than 8, and so on. So you keep doing this until you find all the points that are within this range from 4 to 8. Okay, how many points do I have now? Five points, I guess. One, yeah, about five points. Okay, so this means I actually, when I count them, if I count them five, so from 4 to 8, I have five points. So the frequency of occurrence in this interval from 4 to 8 is 5 points. Okay, You keep doing this for every interval. To make it easy and instead of you know, taking too much time from the uh, webinar, I will just combine the other three from 8 to 16. From 8 to 16 will be the rest of the data points. The rest of the data points will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 points. Then I will put 6 points actually here. So these are the 6 points or the 7 points or whatever, whatever it is. So this is my histogramming of the data I have. So this is how we build the histogram. You go first and you find the range minimum to maximum value of my histogram, of my data. Then you take the range divided into interval. Then you count how many data points within the first interval, second interval, third interval, and so on. And you build or you draw your histogram. So that's the way any software does does the histogram. It depends on you, minimum, maximum, and depends on your data points. It depends on how many how many uh, intervals you need to divide. Your shape of the histogram would be basically based on this on this parameter. So this is how we do the histogramming for our data. Okay, got it. Once actually I do this, I do it for every well. Now I have let's say ten wells in my field. I, I made I made petrophysical analysis for every well. Then you do the averaging for average effective porosity for every well you have. Okay. For example, I have here five wells. Here is well one, well two, well three, well four, and well five. Which we showed this before in the previous uh, webinar. Now I will calculate the average porosity for well one, and it came out to be 16.1. Average porosity for well two is 14.2. Average porosity for three is 15.3. So I calculate the average porosity by creating histogram for each well. So I take the data for well one, create the histogram, and I and look for the average. For well two, do the same. For well three, the same, and so on, until you, end, you finish all the wells in your reservoir. So this means you have every well with full analysis, and every well with an average porosity after your full analysis. Average effective porosity, you know? because we look at effective porosity, not total porosity. Okay, is everybody okay with this? Fine. Once I do this, then you distribute this on the map. You just put this on the map. Let's assume that here is my map. And I have multiple wells in, in my map. I have so many wells here. If you look at the map, actually, Every well will be first of all defined by two very important things, which we call the well location coordinates. We have the x coordinates and the y coordinates. This is the location of the well. Okay, so this well has a certain coordinates. It's 1305, 2750. It means if you take this point on the x axis, it will be 1305. If you go on the y axis, it will be 2750. So this is the well location on this coordination map. Okay. For the coordination map, you have all wells places. Every well is placed in a certain location in your field. Okay? You analyzed all these wells, and you calculated the average porosity for each one of these wells. Everybody understand that? That's when you look at the multi-well. 
So before you do the multi-well, you have to do the single well analysis first. You, you analyze every single well in specific. You finished all the evaluation of the all wells. Then statistically, get the average porosity of every single well on its own. Now you have the average porosity of your the, all the single wells. Then you put all of these on your map. So the map now, I have the well with the location. Well, X and Y coordination in, in this well. So I have the X, Y coordination of every well. Now, here is my X and here is my Y and here is my average cross. So I know every well by X and Y location on the map. And I know the average porosity of my, of my each well individually. Then I take this number and I plot them over the wells. So I feel here, your, your average porosity distribution. For example, the first well has 4.5 average porosity. This well has 6.1 average porosity. This well has 1.9 average porosity. This well has 15 average porosity, 15.2. This well has 15.8. So I know I did this for every single well. Now I posted all my average porosity over my map. Okay? I posted all my average porosity over my map. Now I need to calculate the average porosity of the field now, not for a single well. We went from a single well. Now we need to look at field wide average porosity. How can I do? field-wide average cross. Let's just pay attention to this one, because this is very, very important, and I need to convince you something very important here, okay? I finished evaluation, evaluating every single well. I put the average cross of every single well on the map according to the well location, Amen. Then I will import a note, and you have to keep in mind, Every well is defined by a location on the map, X, Y, X coordinates and Y coordinates, okay? The location defines the porosity in this part of the field. So location defines how the porosity, average porosity in this part of the field, right? Okay. Now, how can I do multi-well statistical analysis? We learn how to do the single well statistical analysis. How can I do multi-well statistical analysis? Will the histogram work or not? Let's just examine this, because this is very important, guys, to examine. Will the histogram give me an average porosity of my field, or that's not going to work? Okay? Let's, let's do a very interesting exercise here, and we'll convince you with this. Now, here is my map that I just looked at before. Here is my porosity, first, first porosity, second, and I listed my porosity in here. Let's just generate a histogram for this day. Okay? Generate the histogram for the field data. Okay, here is my field data. Here is my porosity. What I, how can I do the, my histogramming for the field data? Get the minimum porosity, get the maximum porosity. You create the range. Okay, you divide the range into segments so, or into intervals. And you get the frequency in each interval. We just covered that a few minutes ago. So you go for the minimum maximum for the range. You divide the range into intervals. You get the frequency in each interval. You can you create your histogram. Okay. So what I did, I created the histogram here. I took actually exactly the same number that we took before. So you can you can have have your histogram. Okay. Now, let's just do a game here as an exercise. What if I imagined I imagined I have a redistribution of wells. It means I just redistributed the porosity across the field. What do I mean by this? For example, here is the field originally. Now, I said, well, I will assume that the 12.7 is not in this well. This 12.7 will be in this well, and the, the 4.5 will go to the second well. So this is 12.5, and 4.5 will exchange position. So I will just make, a, make a, an exchange of position and see if this will affect the histogram or not. Okay? So the exercise here. Is the exchange of values across my field will make any difference? Okay, uh, will will this affect my histogram? Yeah, so that's what I did here. I just redistributed the process. This one was 12.5. In the second one, I made it 4.5. So the 4.5, I took it from here, I gave it to this well, and I took the 12.5 and gave it to that well. Here is just I made an exchange. I did this for several of these wells.
If we look at the data now after redistribution, so what I did, I took actually the value of this well, I gave it to this, and the value of this well, I gave it to that. So I just exchange, exchange numbers to see, will this affect my histogram shape? Okay, now if I do this and I generate the histogramming, here is the histogramming for both. It's not gonna make any difference whatsoever because the histogram doesn't take into consideration well location. The histogram, all it does, it looks at the average porosity. If you actually redistribute the data and you then looking for the minimum and the maximum, will it make any difference? No. Yeah. So the redistribution of data is not gonna affect my minimum and maximum. It's not gonna affect my range. It's not gonna affect my, my interval. It's not gonna affect my frequency. So there is no reason that we, these two will give me a different thing. But now we say, this is really bad because this means that the histogram does not differentiate the location of the well. That does, does not take into consideration the location of the well. How can I use this as an evaluation of a field wide? I need a different way that takes into consideration the location of the well. I need to say this location has high porosity. This location has low porosity. This location has intermediate porosity. Will the histogram help me with this? No, it's not. Because the histogram has nothing to do with the location of the well. We just prove this by just redistributing, redistributing the numbers between the first and the second one. It's the same field. I just play the game in the field. I just change the number between the wells. Histogram did not make any difference whatsoever because the histogram doesn't really care about how the numbers are, they are, are, are ex exchanged. All you need to do is, where is the minimum and the maximum? If you exchange the numbers, the minimum and the maximum will be the same. What's, what's the reason to be different? There is no reason to be different, okay? So the minimum and the maximum will be the same for within this range of data. So histogramming is useless, useless, actually in the evaluation of multi-well. So what we took, out of this very simple exercise. Histogram is excellent in evaluating a single well. It will give, you, it will give me the, the average porosity of the single well. But when I all, put all these wells on the map with the X, Y coordinates, histogramming is not gonna do any good for me. It's not gonna make any change for me because it's not taking the, co the coordinates, X, Y, the location of the well, as a function in the way we generate the histogram, okay? All right. So histogram do not reflect with the location, okay? So very in, inappropriate for field statistics. So now one very important things, guys, to have to take into consideration here, you use histogramming for a single well evaluation of porosity, of clay volume, of water saturation, whatever parameter you're talking about or you are interested in, Histogram will do well in a single well evaluation. But when you look at the field wide, where the well location is very important to you, histogram is not going to help out. Histogram is not the proper way to evaluate field location. Okay, now we need to find a different thing, right? Finding a different thing is what the variogram is all about. So the variogram is more advanced. Variogram takes into consideration the location of the wells. So histogram does not take into consideration locations of the wells. Variogram is the variation with the location of the wells. Okay? So the, this, there are very important difference between these two. So the drawback of the histogram, it doesn't take into consideration wells location. The value of the variogram it takes into consideration wells location so I can see the distribution of porosity on my field as a well. Okay? All right. So if I take, here is the two variations, for example, the same example where I redistributed data. I redistributed the, the, the average porosity between both. What happened before is that the histogram did not take this into consideration. Variogram will take this into consideration. So what will be the variogram in this case? The variogram is actually a distribution across the XY coordinates. Here is your X coordinates and here is your Y coordinates. Here is the contour map of your variation of porosity. 
So the variogram is a contour map of porosity, not contour map of depth. Contouring of porosity. Where is the porosity? Now, this is for the first arrangement. How about the second arrangement? When I shuffle the porosity, will be the same? No, to be completely different. For the same data, why they are different? Because it's taken into consideration the redistribution of data that you did. So when you take the well and you, you, do, you did the exercise I just told you about, it's an imaginary exercise, but it will show you the value of the variogram. You have, say, say, 10 wells in your field. You have the average cost of each well. If you just played an exercise and you shuffled the data between the wells, you get absolutely different shape of the very dam. Yeah? Yeah. Just take a look at this here. For example, here's the line of 14 PU. So this is the contour line of the 14 PU. There's also a contour line of 14 PU. So this is high porosity. Where is the low porosity? Here is the line of four. Here is the line of six. Here is the line of nine. Here is the line of 11. Here is the 14. So this means my porosity increases going into the middle of my reservoir. So the low porosity happens at the, at the, at the uh, uh, very northwest of my reservoir and increases in the middle of my reservoir. Means this is the high zone part of my reservoir. Also, this is another high zone part. So this is 14 PU as well. If I go backward here again, here is the 14 porosity contour line, and here is the 14 porosity contour line. So this area has high porosity, and this area has high porosity. Now, if I go to this area here, will this have a 14? No, it has, it has actually five. How about this area? It has also five. So this area has five PU. So this is not the highest part. So after the redistribution, things absolutely change. Where is the highest part of my reservoir? It's right there, where the 15 and the 20 is up to this point. So by redistributing uh, the data in my field as an exercise, okay, I found out the variogram takes into consideration the well location. Will this actually true? Let's just go for the field itself. Okay, here is the field. Look at this zone right here. This zone has 15.2, 16, so this zone has very high porosity, okay? How about this zone? This zone has high porosity as well. As exactly pointed out in the variogram, this zone does not have high porosity. How about this, in, in, in this part? Here is the 12.7, here is the 16. So this part has high porosity. Exactly like the variogram told me. The variogram told me that you will have your high porosity wells almost in the middle of your field. If the distribution takes that form, if you redistributed porosity, then your high porosity will be in this part of the field. Histogram did not tell me this. Histogram will never tell me this. So histogram will lack this, uh, this thing, which is very important to me. Now, if I need to drill a well, I can actually see from the, very, from the variogram, yes, if you, the more wells you put in this part of the field, the more better porosity you will get. That's why you don't see much of drilling in that part of the reservoir. You don't see much of drilling in that part of the reservoir. This is 2.9 and this is 4. Who's going to drill any more wells in this part of the reservoir? But the chunk of the wells will be in the middle here where I can see 16, 15, 16, 12. Good porosity. So I increase my drilling in this part of the field. That's the characterization, guys. You help understand your reservoir better. Where is my high porosity reservoir? Where is my high porosity section in the reservoir? Or the area in the reservoir? Where is the low porosity to avoid going into this part of the reservoir? Because it's not going to be productive. I don't have much porosity in this reservoir, in this part of, of the reservoir. So the one that does this is the variogram. Okay? Variogram is a long process and tedious process. It will take a very long time to, to discuss that. So let's just agree on something here. Histograms are not suitable for field statistics. That's a, that's a fact for field statistics. It's good for single well statistics, okay? We all agree on this message. Histograms are good in single well statistics, okay? Do not consider or take into consideration wells location. That's, that's a drawback. 
example, wells location are important when I look at the field wide. Okay, where is this well located? This is very important part of, of my evaluation. Cannot use, cannot be used to show the low porosity and high porosity areas in the field. Cannot be, the, cannot be uh, used in this. But for the variogram, are the suitable approach for field evaluation, okay? Consider the wells locations, it's very important. And also it shows you where is the, uh, it actually requires a long time to, uh, to go with this. But if you guys really don't know what the variograms are, just drop me an email or probably when you see this webinar, drop a note. And I will, if I can see a lot of you uh, asking for uh, how we evaluate, how we, ca how we create the variogram, I will actually spend at least half an hour or maybe 45 minutes in the Q&A uh, lecture, which is the last, last lecture, uh, or, the, or the end lecture, which will be lecture number five. If I see most of you guys don't really know what a variogram is or how to create a variogram, I will spend half an hour or maybe 45 minutes to, to do this. So send an email or send Dr. Ahmed Garhe an email or just drop a, a, a note in the, uh, in the comments in the, in the webinar. I will take a look at this and if I see lots of people are asking uh, to go through the how we can create a variogram, I'll be happy to do that. But it's, as I told you, it's a long process and uh, it will take a long time to, uh, uh, to do this. But I really need to go and look at something uh, else here, which is the flow unit. And that's also something very important, okay? So we now, so we ended up with this part of, of the, of the uh, lecture is we've looked at the, what is effective porosity? We created histogramming for effective porosity for each well individually. We took this number, we distributed on the field wide. So for every well location, we put the value of the average porosity for each well. Then we found out we need to look at the field wide. What is the distribution of porosity as a field wide? We proved that the histogram is not gonna help me out. The one that's gonna help me out really is the variogram because variogram takes into consideration the variation of the well's location, okay? And that's very important in the evaluation of the areas and the, zone, the zones on, in, in, the, in, our, in our field where it has high porosity and low porosity. So we can actually concentrate or understand better when we drill our wells to increase our production. Okay? Now, from this, we need to talk about the flow units. What is a flow unit? Flow unit is the part of the reservoir that flows your hydrocarbon or flows, flows flows. This is great that, that way because sometimes you produce water with the hydrocarbon. Okay? We're not interested in the water production. We actually like to minimize this as much as we can, but it's part of, part, part of the flow and it will happen sooner or later. If it didn't happen sooner, it will happen later. You know, all the, all the dynamic of our reservoirs. Okay? So we need to know what, are, what, is, what is the flow unit. So pay attention very well to what is flow unit. Flow units are controlled by two parameters. One of them I can say the heavy parameter, which is the, the permeability. Porosity is a secondary parameter. So the primary parameter for controlling flow units is the permeability. The secondary parameter of controlling the flow units is the porosity, okay? So porosity is a, a, a secondary parameter, but the main parameter for the flow units is the permeability. So permeability is the one that we rely heavily to look at the reservoir, the, the, the reservoir flow unit. So reservoir flow units, flow units are controlled by permeability as well as porosity. <clears throat> when I say as well as porosity, so the porosity is not the primary one, okay? It's the secondary one. Okay? We like to have high permeability, high porosity, that's fine. But sometimes you can have low, low porosity, high permeability, and still you can produce Good, good, good value of your reservoir. We actually rely on cord wells. That's why in every field, we have one, at least one, two, three cord wells. That would be a choice of the geologist, okay? For so many reasons, to understand that the, the position and environment, to go and measure porosity and permeability, to go and measure the uh, uh, wettability of the rock, cap pressure of the rock. We, we need the core data for so many reasons. One of the re most important reasons that we actually measure porosity and permeability on core plugs, okay? So the, with the help of the geologist, 
you look at the rock itself and you look at the variation of your rock, then you pick certain certain depths where you take plugs in there. In the plugs, you go and send this and these plugs will be taken in the core lab where the porosity and permeability will be measured on the plug. This is the main thing in our identification of flow units. Okay, so we rely heavily on the core data in identifying our flow units, how we understand our flow units from our reservoir. So values of porosity and permeability are the two major inputs in the way we evaluate our flow unit. And we get this by learning from the core first before you apply all over the field. You have to learn from the core data, then you apply on a field wide. Okay, we'll go through this. So field flow units are built using the core measure porosity and permeability. So that's how we actually look at our flow units. Okay? All right. Field example. Here's actually an example of, of, of a certain well. This well is from the Middle East without saying uh, from where it is. Actually, what I have here, I have the triple combo, a gamma ray, resistivity, neutron density is normal. Then I have core data. Here is my, this, these black dots, I core porosity. Core porosity, porosity measured on the core plugs. Okay? For the same core plugs, we also measure permeability. So we measure for every plug. We measure the porosity and the permeability for every plug. Okay? And you can see huge variation in permeability. First of all, porosity is, is plotted on linear scale. That's normal because there is not really much variation in porosity. While in permeability, you can see a plug with one millidarcy and the next plug with a thousand millidarcy. If you put this on linear, it's not gonna work. You can see huge scattering with no correlations whatsoever. So normally we put permeability on a logarithmic scale. Don't ever forget this guys. You will never see anybody plotting permeability on a linear scale. We all plot permeability on logarithmic scale because there is huge variation on permeability. If you put this on a linear scale, you're not even going to see anything. Okay? So, porosity is always on linear scale. Permeability is always on logarithmic scale. Okay? So, now I have so many plugs covered the whole section of my reservoir. I can see porosity variation and I can see permeability variation. One thing that we do is to look at the whole, uh, uh, the whole well. What is the relationship between porosity and permeability? So what we do actually, we draw a cross plot. Cross plot between porosity in the x-axis, permeability in the y-axis. And as you can see, porosity on the x-axis is linear, but permeability is logarithmic. So permeability on the y-axis, is you never see anybody again plotting permeability on a linear scale. That's not gonna work, okay? So permeability is always on logarithmic scale. Then a porosity is always on linear scale. As you can see right here, lots of scattering. I don't really understand anything here. And the most important part is, let's just take, for example, a certain porosity. Here is a porosity line of 18 PU. We pay attention to this very clearly. Here is 18 PU line. At the 18 PU line, I found a plug here. This plug is reading very low permeability, 0 0.7 millidars. So a teen porosity plug is reading 0 0.7 millidars permeability. On the other hand, I can see this plug is also a teen PU and it's reading 12 millidars for the same 18 PU. So the same two different plugs. They have the same porosity but they vary very much in permeability. So, okay. Let me, let me take another example. Here is another plug right there. I'll take this plug. I can see it's reading 150 millidars. Huge variation. If I take the plug at the top here, I can see this plug is reading 1,000 millidars. Man, for the same porosity, these plugs have the same porosity but they are different in what? Different in permeability. So what conclusion can you draw from this? It's very simple conclusion. Porosity and permeability are not correlated and you will never see it correlated. Porosity and permeability, they will never correlate. 
Okay? So this means that high porosity does not always mean high permeability. Low porosity does not always mean low permeability. Okay? So that's a fact. We can see that here. That's a fact. I can see plugs have the same value of porosity, but the variation in permeability is huge. Okay? So learn this. Never ever think that porosity, uh, porosity controls permeability. No. There is no relationship between porosity and permeability. We try to understand or make some type of correlation, but there is no direct relationship between porosity and permeability. Is this only in this well, or it happens in nature? No, it happens in nature. Look at the literature. Here is the literature. Okay? If you look at any literature book, it's exactly the same. Here is the porosity on the x-axis. Here is the permeability on the y-axis. If you take a line of porosity here and you intersect it, this one, it will give you very low permeability. If you go to this one, it gives you a higher permeability. If you go to this one, it gives you it's exactly what we saw in this field. So this field is no, you know, it's, it's not something here. Uh, on its own, it's the normal thing that we see in every single well. Okay? Porosity and permeability are not correlated because porosity is not the controller of permeability. Then what is the controller of permeability? We need to understand that. What is the controller of permeability? This was actually defined here. It's the poor throat is the controller of permeability, not the porosity value. Not the porosity value. Is the pores are connected on that or not? Are the pores connected or not? Which we call it pore throat. We talked about this in one of the previous webinars when we talked about the reservoir rock properties. Pore throat is the one that controls permeability. And let's just look at this. In this example, for example, we have two pores here and they have a throat in between and the fluid actually goes from one pore to the other by the throat. When the throat is big, permeability is big. For example, when the throat, the throat is measured by micro, micrometer, when the throat is 0.1 micrometer, permeability is very low. But when the throat is 20 micrometer, the permeability is very high. So take it this, keep it in your mind, never ever forget it. Porosity is not the controller of permeability. The controller of the permeability is the poor throat that connects the pores together. So you can have 20 PU and you don't have any permeability whatsoever. And you can have 5 PU and you can have good permeability. So porosity and permeability are not, are not related. It depends on the pore throat that you have in your rock. Yes, everybody agree to this? We saw this in our well, we saw this in the literature. Everybody's talking about it because porosity and permeability are not related whatsoever. Okay. Now, if I need to understand now my reservoir, if porosity and permeability are not related, I'm, I'm in a dilemma. How can I know the productivity of my reservoir? I need to find a way to find out the productivity of my reservoir, which we call flow units. Okay? Now I will take a look at every part of my reservoir here. Okay? So zonation or flow units is the most important. What do I mean by zonation? Let's just take a look at the reservoir on a zone by zone. If I look at the bottom section of the reservoir here, here is bottom section. If I look at this, I can see the porosity is decreasing. Everybody, everybody see that? Here is, here is the high porosity, here is the low porosity. And I can see in this section, different than the upper one. From this section, I can see the porosity is decreasing. And at the same time, I see permeability is decreasing. So these two, this part of the reservoir, has a certain type of property. When the porosity decreases, permeability decreases. I call this a zone on its own. I call this a zone on its own. Because this is a zone. This is a zone that has a certain property between porosity and permeability. So I will take this part of the reservoir and I will call it zone one. Now, if I draw a relationship between this porosity and this permeability on a cross plot, okay? Here is my porosity and my permeability. You can see the correlation now. So I can actually take a look at the total well and try to divide it into subzones, which we call it the flow units. So you cannot handle the whole reservoir as one thing. We saw a lot of scattering, doesn't mean anything, okay? 
but we need to look at every zone and see the zone that has certain correlation. We call this zone a flow unit. So this flow unit has certain type of porosity, certain type of permeability, and they are correlated in a way, as I can see here, it's not a perfect correlation, but they, when I see increase in porosity in that direction, I see increase in permeability in that direction. We call this a flow unit or flow unit number one. We generate the, the relationship between the logarithm of the permeability on the y-axis and the linear porosity on the x-axis, okay? Now, use this relationship that you built for this zone for all similar zones in your other field. For example, this is the core well. I actually took a look at this zone. Then I have to go for the second well. Where is that zone in the second well? I use this equation to calculate permeability in the second zone. Where is that zone in the third well? I use the, my equation to calculate permeability for the third well, and so on. So you take a look at this zonation, and you see how this zone is distributed in your field. We call this the flow unit one, which is a certain relationship between porosity and permeability. Okay? How can I get my porosity? Well, your porosity is very, very well known, comes from the neutron density. You actually have the neutron density in every single well, so you can get your porosity. Plug it in this equation, you calculate the permeability for every zone that's similar in characteristics of this zone. So you look at the field, and you look, this zone that I learned from the core is exactly the zone in, in well one, in well two, in well three, in well four. It can vary because of the deposition. So you go for every zone similar to the zone that you actually had in your, in your, uh, in your core well, and you apply the correlation. Now, if I apply the correlation, look, look at this. Here is my calculated permeability versus the core permeability. I can agree well with the core permeability using this correlation. I finished this zone, but I cannot apply this zone on the upper one. The upper one is different, even the value of the permeability. That's why we look at this zone, and I say, okay, when the porosity decreased here, my permeability decreased. When the porosity decreased here, my permeability decreased. When the porosity increased here, my permeability increased. So I can see a decrease and increase in porosity and permeability. Then I will take this one, I say, this is another zone, another flow unit. Why? Because it has different permeability than the bottom one but it still has a relationship between porosity and permeability. So you build this relationship again for this specific zone, and you build your equation for this specific zone. You apply this for all similar zones across your field. So you build your permeability across your field, and you build your correlation of flow units across your field. How can I get my porosity? Similar to the previous one. This is from the neutron density average porosity that we learned in the previous seminar, or the previous webinar. So you build all these uh, zonations based on the way you look at the data and the way you characterize the data. That's why we call them characterization engineer. You correct, characterize this data and you build your understanding of, of the flow units. You repeat to the other one, for example, this, this, this one. The porosity is decreasing, permeability is decreasing. Frosty is decreasing, permeability is decreasing. Frosty is decreasing, permeability is decreasing. You can see right here, you can see this. So you can actually take the first one and you say, this is another zone. So how many zones I have now? One, two, three, and the, 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 other, the, the fourth one is a fourth zone. And that's why you mark this depth as the first zone, second zone, third zone, fourth zone, and you take this and you correlate with the entire field. When you go, you go for the correlation of the entire field, remember the first webinar, we correlate the entire field on TVD. You get all your wells on TVD, then you can see the flow of your zonation across the entire field, taking a certain cross-section, hanging all your wells on TVD at a certain data, then you can see how these zonations are related to each other in your full reservoir, okay? So to understand the, the, the production of your reservoir through, through the flow units, you get the learning in the beginning from the core well, you build 
the correlation for each zone from the cord well, then you apply the correlation for all the wells that have the same characteristic of each zone, then you get a field-wide correlation of your flow units, and you get this through, as, as I said, from lecture one, the cross-section on TVD, you build all these correlations together to understand how the flow unit is distributed across your, across your reservoir. So that's when I came up all the zonation, which we call them the flow units. So this is the flow units that we have across my, uh, from this well, and I will apply across my, my reservoir, okay? All right? This actually, uh, we, we, why we see this different zonation, if you really go back and work with the geologist, and that's you need to do for any, any reservoir characterization engineer, you cannot actually do this on isolation. You have to work with the geologist, because there is a reason why your rock is acting this way, and the geologist will be the best to really tell you why this is happening. That's why we call this phases one, we call the phases two, phases three, and phases four. So the variation is due variation in phases, and the one who's gonna be able to find this out and relate this to the change in phases and deposition, that will be the geologist. So when you pick your zonation, don't pick them on your own, just by looking at the number, you have to go back and consult with a geologist, and the geologist will help you out to confirm, yes, this is a zonation on its own. I can see characteristics different than the upper zonation. Then go ahead, identify this as a flow unit, a flow unit based on porosity permeability relationship. Many people use all these cross plots ambiguously. And guys, be careful when you do these cross plots because I saw so many webinars that's just talking about cross plots and cross plots. Things are more with this visualization. Look at your data, plot them in a way discuss with your geologist, make sure that the, the, the flow in is in, in, in also good agreement with the geologist because he's the one who understands the environmental deposition of your rock and he's the one who have, have, will have a big input in the way you identify your, your flow units. Okay? So flow units determination steps, examine the cord wells, determine the zones that have correlation between process and permeability. Every zone is called a flow unit create the correlation uh, between the process and permeability for each zone, apply the correlations to all wells across your field, and build the field-wide flow units using field correlation on TVD, as discussed in the, in the previous webinar. Okay, thank you very much. And it was really a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa uh, Rabi, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, we have got a few questions. A student is asking, uh, which porosity tool is affected by the gas effect? Uh, actually, all porosity tools are affected by gas. Okay, gas. Actually, let me let me explain this because I explained that in the formation evaluation part. Okay. So, um, as as I as I mentioned in the uh, in the formation evaluation. Uh, actually, the neutron two, for example, is is measuring the number of hydrogen in the pore space. Now, if I compare the number of hydrogen in the pore space, is if the pore space is filled with gas versus the number of hydrogen in the pore space if it's filled with oil, for sure the number of hydrogen atoms or the hydrogen density, we sometimes we call it hydrogen index, in the gas is much less than that of the oil. So what's your expectation? The neutron tool will read low porosity. So the neutron tool reads low porosity in gas because neutron tool responds to number of atoms of hydrogen in the gas, which is much lower than the number of atoms of hydrogen in, in the liquid. So that's why in the gas zones, it will be affected because it will see less hydrogen than it should. At the same time, the density the density of, of the gas is less than the density of the liquid, either oil or water. So this means the density will read less density. So you will see two things. You will see less density and you will see less neutron. So yes, the neutron and the density, by definition, will be affected. We did not discuss the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance like NMR. It will be also affected. Uh, sonic will be uh, yeah, affected, maybe the least affected, but to be also affected. All logs will be affected, and we, we understand this, take this into consideration as well. Okay? 
Um, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Mustafa Rabi. We have another question. Uh, a student is asking, uh, Neutron tool gives us total or effective porosity. If no, is there any tool that can give us the total or effective porosity? Okay, no tool. The triple combo then don't give you effective porosity. Effective porosity is clay corrected porosity. Again, are you asking about effective porosity? Let me, let me expand on this. If you're asking about affecting, effective porosity from the petrophysis characterization and the, uh, and the uh, 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 formation evaluation, guys, effective porosity is clay corrected porosity. The neutron tool measures total. It cannot do the effective porosity on its own. The density tool measures total. It cannot do the correction on its own. So the neutron tool and the density tool, they measure total porosity. And it's your job to do the correction as we explain in this webinar, okay? So all the neutron density and all of these tools, they measure total porosity. Now, there is another tool in the market, it's called NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance. This tool is capable of giving you effective porosity as a measurement. This is the only tool. It's an expensive tool. We did not cover this in any of these webinars. Probably we'll talk about the NMR in some other webinars, maybe in the future. But the NMR is the only one that's capable of measuring effective porosity because it's capable of measuring clay effect separate from the total measurement, okay? But the neutron and the density, which we usually do or usually use in daily basis, they are not capable of measuring effective porosity. They only give you total porosity and it's on you to correct the total porosity for the effect for the uh, effect of the clay. Okay. Okay, uh, professor. Uh, another yeah. student is asking, uh, can you tell me uh, which log from which log we can read the porosity? Is it from neutron density? Actually, the porosity is not from the neutron and not from the density. The porosity is the average neutron density. You go to the neutron density and you be you put yourself in the middle between the neutron and the density. And actually the previous seminar was the whole previous seminar talking about this, not the neutron. And I put this very clearly. The porosity is, when, is not the neutron porosity, is not the density porosity, is the average of the neutron density porosity. If you wanna read this from the log, you go between the neutron and density curves, go in the middle and go and read up the value of the porosity. That's your porosity because it's the average neutron density process. Okay, okay uh, another student is asking, uh, radiogram is generated only by the softwares or we can do it manually? Actually, you can do it manually. And uh, that's, uh, as I said, if you guys don't know how to do that, uh, just drop me an email, drop Dr. Ahmed al garhi an email or write a comment uh, at the, uh, in this webinar. I will collect all of this if I can see a majority of, of you guys wants to talk about variogram, I will explain how to do the variogram. Mm -hmm. Softwares do the variogram, and also you can do the variogram with your hand. And my, my students actually do variogram with their bare hands. I would like my students to graduate without knowing how we do this, even on a small scale. Because if you start doing it on, on softwares, you have no clue what the software is doing. You have to build your feeling of how these things are generated before you even touch uh, a, a button on the uh, on the on the, uh, on the software. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mustafa Ravi. That's all we have for today, uh, guys. If you have any more queries, uh, so you can email Dr. Mustafa Ravi, or you can save your questions for the next lecture, and then you can ask. And also, if you have not joined the Google Classroom, so join it fastly and do your quizzes to get your certificate. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Dr. Mustafa Urabi. Uh, we look forward to see you again. And until then, please take care and stay safe. Thank you.